information technologies project, the transformation of businesses using information technologies, published four books and several research papers. She so worked for Intercorporation, Tata Group in India, and Business Consulting, AE Business Consulting, uh, Business Solutions Consulting. The third one is Chantal Sathi, who is founding CEO of Cornerstone, again, and from Canada. I think anyone from Canada, please, you know, you can just give her a who, and uh, which is on mission to reduce, right? Chantal, you are from Canada, right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. The Canadian, that's right. Yes. <laughs> so, and, um, you know, she is actually doing something which is really, really interesting. And uh, it's kind of started recently, but it's a super important topic for all of us to understand. And that is reducing bias in the artificial intelligence algorithm. Or in other words, making sure that the machine is actually doing something that's not completely biased and doing something, you know, weird based on the data that has been fed, fed to it. The ethical AI powered technology, which is once again, I think is the direction to go in the future is designed to detect discriminatory biases like race, ethnic, gender, which is created by the bias in the data itself. Uh, she's an alum of Oxford and serves on their alumni board and is currently a PhD candidate in ASU, Arizona State University, studying innovation in global development for ethical AI. And our last, Panelist is Jennifer Wang. She's a director in product management for the framework team at Workday. A lot of us are now familiar with that particular product since it has been introduced at LMU. She oversees an array of foundational products such as business process, organization, documents that serve the core functionalities. Born in Hong Kong, an amazing city, Jennifer has lived, studied, and worked in her hometown, Australia, and the United States. Her global background has exposed her to different challenges that people with diverse backgrounds are facing in different settings. She has been on multiple missions to support vulnerable communities in China and continues her footprint in the United States. She is an alum of UCL Anderson School of Management holding an MBA degree. Moderating the panel is our own Lauren Stanford, an LMU grad student. Lauren is the founder and CEO of Cierto, a blockchain-based startup that was in last semester LMU business incubator. And once again, you know, all of you know that that is, again, is one of the technology that's going to drive everything that we, we, we can put our hands on in the future, whether it's payment, supply chain, currency, whatever it is. Seattle aims to protect the intellectual property rights of professional and amateur choreographers with a unique combination of blockchain technology. She holds a chief information resource officer position at the block at LMU, again, a something that has been founded by the students. It's a blockchain association. Those of you who are interested in probably joining the block, please get in touch with Jennifer afterwards. So Lauren, congratulations on launching your company. And with that, I will turn it over to you to moderate the panel. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Seal. Okay, so I think we can jump right into our questions. Um, we're going to start with Jeanette Duval of Capgemini. So um, my first question for you, Jeanette, how would you define digital transformation? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. So as Dr. Kill just uh, introduced, I'm working uh, in Capgemini, which is fifth largest technology uh, services provider uh, globally, actually. And I've been working, I've been managing the portfolio of uh, global uh, software technology partners um, in the amount of five, 500 million to a billion uh, euros of revenue per year. Uh, so I had a lot of exposure to the uh, enterprise technology world and, and business development uh, together with our partners. So in terms of the digital transformation, uh, it's a quite an overused uh, word, right? It's a big buzzword. And frequently when I used to explore new partners on board new uh, or on board uh, new technology partners, I would uh, frequently first try to understand what is it they're actually doing. I would go to their website and my colleagues uh, would do the same. And their first page would be talking about digital transformation. And quite frequently I would be frustrated because I was I would be thinking, what is it actually they're doing in terms of digital transformation? Because whoever partner I go to, everybody's talking about uh, digital transformation. And probably the reason for that is in simple terms, any use of technology to improve business 
is the digital transformation, right? Any use of technology, be it ERP, like SAP, or Internet of Things, or artificial intelligence we'll talk about later today, all of it, when it is applied for to business for uh, to achieve better productivity and efficiency, it's all can be called the digital transformation. And uh, also, I look at it in two ways. Uh, when we, you know, read all these um, magazine articles or books, when it talks about, uh, they talk about digital transformation, they frequently talk about something really, really innovative and exciting, the transformation of business models, or even the whole industries like Uber, Airbnb, and Netflix. We kept talking about them, right, as uh, some of the top digital transformation players. Uh, actually, myself, sometime back, uh, still back in Russia, I founded a digital platform business myself uh, a few years before Uber or Airbnb, where unfortunately that uh, digital platform uh, was not in the taxi or hotel in business, otherwise probably I would have another job right now. Uh, the platform was about connecting beauty services provider with uh, end users, right? With, normally with women who would consume those services at their uh, home or work uh, location. So when we talk about this kind of the holistic change of the business model, that's, that's uh, the first, first kind of sense of the digital transformation the way I see it. But um, you cannot expect creating a new Uber-like business model in your company or your industry every day. Right? That's not something which is very frequent. So in a day-to-day -day sense, also at my work here in uh, Capgemini, the digital transformation is about um, transforming existing business processes uh, to better address the needs of your current customers. Right, So it's, it's not that much transformational, it's more sequential in terms of application of technology to improve and bring better efficiencies into your existing business processes. Uh, so examples of that could be, uh, for example, um, intelligent automation application of it to uh, insurance, claim, insurance claims processing, finance invoice processing, where you can automatically scan, read and process the documents and thus free up your workforce for better value added uh, activities. Right, that's uh, one simple example and another one a little bit more technical. Um, um, most of you, I guess, know about the uh, cloud top cloud players like AWS, Google, and Microsoft Azure. Right, they're of course transforming the um, infrastructure layer of the enterprises today. The challenge is when you, as an enterprise, start working with a certain cloud provider, you're locked in uh, over the long term into their infrastructure, and so you have more limited power to negotiate financial terms. But there's a te containerization technology which allows to kind of um, abstract the underlying infrastructure layer across multiple cloud players. And thus you can freely move your workloads across Azure, Microsoft, it doesn't matter uh, on a, in a minute, in a second, right? Uh, so that's another technology which enables you for uh, kind of a transformation on, a, on the infrastructure layer in terms of um, technology itself. So just to sum it up, I would define technology, digital transformation as it's more about transformation of the business versus digital, right? But the digital part is about technology, which is the enabler for your business transformation. I hope that was not <laughs> uh, too long <laughs> the answer, but uh, yeah, that's that's what I think about it. No, thank you, Jeanette. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, along the same lines, um, what industries are you seeing embracing these technologies the most? And are you seeing any promising trends? So uh, maybe I'll stay true to my enterprise technology um, background, uh, right, and talk about Amazon. Amazon kind of uh, from two perspectives. One, which is familiar to everybody, Amazon Marketplace, right? They started at a, as a bookstore in Seattle 20 or so years ago, and then they expanded their platform to all the other retailers. And today they're controlling 50% of the retail market in the US, right? This is a very familiar story to everybody. Now, Move forward to today, Amazon Web Services, it's uh, just another cloud player, right? Even though it's a leading player, but what they're doing in the enterprise technology world, and I think this is the change, transformational change, which is happening today. Same as they onboarded retailers a long time ago, they are onboarding enterprise technology software players, ISVs, independent software vendors, onto their platform so that you as an enterprise, you can procure any software, any enterprise technology software, which is not from Amazon, from anybody else, right? Uh, through Amazon, right? So Amazon is becoming another channel, another platform, but this, this time not for books or, I don't know, your retail products, but for actual enterprise technology. So if previously, for example, you needed to 
procure, for example, Red Hat Linux, right, or Red Hat OpenShift Kubernetes platform, you would go to Red Hat, you have to, you would have to uh, sign the um, uh, end user license agreement, procurement agreement, you have to sign financial terms. Now you don't have to do all of that, even though the majority of business is still done the old way, but you can go to Amazon platform and just click there and everything is automatically connected on legal, financial and technical um, aspects of it. So that's another transformation which is um, happening. And just from the long-term perspective, uh, as the cloud adoption increases, I think um, I wouldn't be surprised in, if in five or 10 years, Amazon controls the majority of the enterprise technology market, same as they do for the retail market today. I hope that was not too technical. <laughs> okay. No, thank you, Jenna. Yeah, sure, Lauren. Okay, I'm gonna go to Chantal now. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the technology you mentioned previously. The, um, it's called Bias Finder AI. Um, what is BiasFinder AI and how is it developed uh, and what are your data sources? Well, first of all, I would just like to start by saying thank you. Thank you very much for having me as a panelist. LMU, you are all doing an amazing job and it is an honor to be here. First, I just wanted to backtrack for a little bit and actually explain what is AI. It's important for us to at least have a common ground because many of us come from different areas. We may not even be in artificial intelligence or tech. When I'm speaking to people, I always try to define AI as the theory and the development of computer science that is able to perform tasks that's normally required by human beings. So for example, we can think about facial recognition. We can think about trying to take one language and converting it into another language. And even the way that we actually decide and make rational decisions for outcomes that's there. AI systems, they learn from data. Data is a hot topic. It is an important piece of practically every industry that's there right now. And including its biases, it can perpetuate that bias on a massive scale. The racism, the sexism, ageism, and other bias that permeates our culture also inherently adds the data is added into the data collection. And in turn, it is processed within an AI system that's trained on that data. So what we are doing at Cornerstone AI is we've actually invented a technology. We've invented a software that can detect discrimination biases in large machine learning models. So this is where my doctoral research comes into play. I'm gonna actually show you a clip so you can see what this looks like when data is being processed. But this is important because this is the first time that software like this has been created based on brand new algorithms and codings on cause and effect algorithms instead of just looking for correlations in data points. So if it's okay for me, Lauren, to share my screen, is that all right? Yeah, that'd be great. You should have permission. Perfect. So this is the bias finder. What you're seeing is software right now. We've just got the IP and the trademarks for the bias finder, but this is an example of what the algorithms have coded, but you're seeing now a larger screen that's coming up with colored rows and columns. This is a data set, which you're seeing in front of you right now of maybe about, in total, there's 2 million records in this data set. But right now I've just highlighted, I've asked my data engineers to highlight and show you what an audit for a data set would look like. This is what the bias finder does. It'll scan through millions and millions of records. We isolate for a certain variable that's there, either gender, ethnicity, a postal code, any specific variable. We call it the sensitive variable that's there in a data set. And then finally, at the end, we compute a whole statistical analysis and create an executive summary and report for any industry that's looking to actually audit their machine learning models. And I'll stop sharing right there. So that's the bias finder in a nutshell. Thank you for explaining that. Um, to go a little further into custom machine learning systems that you're designing for your clients, um, what are your clients using those for? And what trends are you seeing um, with those organizations? 
Great. So some of our clients right now, I definitely have to say by God's grace, we've already gotten into the U.S. federal government and the strategic partnerships that I've actually built the company on is within the Department of Defense, Veterans Affairs, and even looking at Homeland Security. So the beauty of that is we have already created and there's no investors for Cornerstone, by the way, we've just solely funded it ourselves, myself actually, and a few others in our core team. And we've actually looked at the proof of concepts within the healthcare industry, financial institutions, as well as the justice system that's there. So if you just research cornerstone-ai.com on our website, you'll see our proof of concepts. And I'm happy to link it in the chat box after, but all of our strategic partnerships within the federal government are looking at the way that we can actually utilize this software, bring it into a system that can holistically look at making more inclusive and equal and diverse systems that's there, but also allowing people to make sure that we are on the right track towards a certain justice system. And Lauren, do you mind uh, restating the last part of your question? I think it was a two-part piece that was there. Yes, I was just wondering if you're seeing any trends um, yeah. in that area. Great question. So the trends that I'm currently seeing to date right now is this whole push for ethical AI. People are talking about ethical AI. We have to implement it. We have to get a framework. They're looking at IEEE. They're looking at NIST. Other massive entities that's out there that is trying to create trends transparent, accurate algorithms, auditing these processes and systems. But I think this is the scope and the platform of real in invention. This is the time when people can invent, can reproduce, can think outside of the box to come up with solutions. It's very similar to what I think the dean of your school, when she just spoke at the beginning and shared a little bit of her message and the welcome, it was really inspiring because it allowed me to think, well, that is what innovation is. And the trend towards ethical AI is also pointing in the direction of audits. I strongly think that that is something that we all have to consider. AI systems have to be audited. And this is also why my doctoral research is focusing on this area, because it is the future and it will affect the generations that are to come. That's wonderful. And congrats on getting it into the federal government. That's no wonderful. problem. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. And I just want to say a quick shout out to my mom. She's here from Toronto. So I just wanted to say hi very quickly. Oh. I never get to see my family too often. So just wanted to say a shout out to her. That's so sweet. Um, I did have just one last question. Um, along the same lines, uh, what ideological shifts do you think need to take place to speed up adoption in other industries? So other industries that's using AI technology? Or, or in current industries that are adopting it just to speed up overall adoption? I, the first thing that comes to my mind is number one, building a business case. Many times when I'm speaking to different clients within the federal government at a national level or even a global level, many people do not actually know why they need an AI system in place and what is the problem that these algorithms are designed to solve. I think taking the time to actually sit there and analyze that on the onset would actually do a lot of good to humanity. I also think it's equally important to make sure that when we are trying to decide how an AI technology system is to come in place, either to process data or to look at robotics, understanding what is the best for that organization and institution should also be taken into consideration, but also look at the outcomes and the impacts of these models for your whole ecosystem that's there. That's wonderful. Thank you. I think that's something we can all take with us. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask my next question to Anna Mangel of LMU. Um, so how would you define digital transformation and why do you believe it's relevant? Thank you, Lauren. So adding uh, on to what uh, Jeanette was talking about, I want to share a little bit of my story and why I felt digital uh, transformation has been significant throughout my career and even more so now. Um, after my undergraduate degree, I was working in the MIS department of a large manufacturing company when I came to know that our divisional manager about a year after working there was leaving. So I started thinking, well, we gather all of, our, all of the data from the manufacturing 
manufacturing uh, companies, various divisions. Uh, we input them into our big IBM mainframe computer, which we were using at that time. Uh, we print out reports and give it to the managers every morning. Uh, why do the executives feel that the MIS department was just a cost function and not really adding value? And then somebody asked me, well, how long are the reports that you print out every day and give to your managers and they have a hundred page reports? Wait a minute, which manager has that kind of time to, to read a report and get value from it? So I came to the United States to Carnegie Mellon University to do my thesis, uh, PhD thesis, to study this you know, with the adoption of technology, how are organizations able to get value? So when anecdotally, I talk to um, entrepreneurs as well as managers, what I found them uh, telling me when I asked them, you are, you are adopting a new computer system, is it going to bring you value? And the response was a very meant yes. However, when I looked at the existing literature at that time, what it showed was there was either no significant impact or, or in some cases, even negative impact. Um, so taking that a step further, yes, organizations were implementing information technology even at that time, but the business organizations were not changing to be able to get value from the implementation of these computer technologies. So that's adding directly to what Jeanette was mentioning in terms of digital transformation is all about the business uh, function transforming with the adoption of technology to be able to get value for the organization. So some digital transformation elements that are often cited are one we can guess is operational agility, organizations being able to uh, change their operations, their technology and information on an ongoing basis to be able to compete, to customer experience, always thinking about how do we make that better and better. Third, it comes from the leadership. So it comes down to the culture of the entire organization that's set by the leadership. Workforce enablement is fourth, empowering employees. And fifth is uh, digital technology integration, which is not only should we be using technology, we should actually be integrating technology into what we do. And third, even further is in technology becoming immersive. It is becoming a part of the way we do business. So I want to leave you with this one last point in the recent um, Harvard Business Review article, uh, there was talk about how companies uh, are creating value today has shifted from value actually coming from external partners as opposed to from people working within the organization. They calling this an inverted form. The concept there is if you think about the most valuable companies today, Fang, I'm going to go with uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google as uh, these five companies, which we call the platform companies. How are they creating value? Uh, Facebook and uh, Google don't create their own posts. Amazon does not create any of the products itself. Apple and Google do not uh, create their own apps, yet the value that they are generating, that these have been generating for them has, is, is you know, just, just significant. Um, so just leaving that with room for thought in terms of where is the value coming from in terms of organizations today. Thank you, Anna. I'm going to go to Jennifer. I think she has something to add along those same lines um, due to your role at Workday, Jennifer. Uh, within your role as the director of product management at Workday, um, what efficiency gains and general trends are you seeing um, internally and at other organizations? Thank you for the question. And I'll also start by sharing, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm learning so much just sitting in here and taking notes myself. So thank you for being, allowing me to be part of this. Um, building on top of what Vandana has shared, uh, one of the things that really resonated with me is how the adoption of technology is what creates value. 
I'll share a couple of examples. Um, the first one is what I see, um, a project that actually my team is working on in invoice processing and how the adoption of technology actually creates value for any procurement department. So if you're, imagine you're in a procurement department, you um, have to process all these invoices coming from many different vendors um, on a daily basis. Different vendors have different format of the invoices. So you can imagine finding all the information you need to process them, say in Workday, can be really, really manual. Um, the cost of processing invoice ranges from 10 to $15 per invoice, and it can take up to 10 days. In Workday Supply Invoice Automation, this whole initiative and feature, what we provide is how we can ingest technology to fuel um, the processing of all of these manual processes. For, we have machine learning to OCR the invoices. So regardless of what format, what layout these invoices have, we have machine learning to help us to get the gist of what amount, what number, et cetera, that you need to process it. We also have machine learning to help categorize these invoices so that based on the defined category that you have set in your system, let it be IT equipment, marketing equipment, whatever it is, um, you can categorize these invoices. We also have an intelligent queue management um, solution where instead of having everyone to screen through every single invoice and determine which one you need to dip further for quality checks, we have um, algorithms um, support by machine learning that it will recommend one to do the quality checks only on an as need basis and it also does smart uh, load balancing so not everyone need to review every single thing and finally we also based on what ha what are the data that have been entered through machine learning um, what can we also recommend that additional fields are which at some point do still require required uh, manual uh, entries, but at least it has some recommendation for you to minim based on what you have in the past in the similar pattern to minimize manual errors and improve efficiencies. So all of this is a great example of how we're using these new te technologies to help improve the overall invoice processing and that lowers the cost and advertise processing time for our customers. Another example I'll throw in a sh short one, since a lot of you are also already using Workday, is how me as a people leader in Workday um, see efficiency gain for myself. I, at Workday, I spend most of my time using three software, Zoom, Slack, and email. I don't really go to Workday every day, but when my team members ask for PTO, now because, and maybe something else you also has, like right now Workday has got a connection into Slack. So when uh, my employee asks me to for PTO, I don't need to go to work to approve. I can approve the VIN Slack. So that's a huge efficiency for me that I don't need to jump out of my natural workspace. So those are my two examples I'd like to share. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to take it back to Anna Mangal of LMU. Um, LMU recently began using Workday to manage a variety of processes. Um, what has your personal experience been? And what are you seeing take place in academia? Uh, yes, so I joined LMU early last year and uh, I uh, have to admit, I was having a challenging time with the various different systems. Uh, by the time I got my arms around one, I would have to figure out a new one. Uh, and then came Workday. Uh, and uh, I know we've been, just like Jennifer mentioned, we've been talking about it's a large system and it's been difficult to get our arms around it. Uh, but, in, but in academia, I've been finding that now there's a one go-to system. So I have to learn one system and all my applications are integrated within it. And I'd like to take that a little bit further, Lauren, to talk a little bit about um, you know, the, this fourth industrial revolution technologies, if I may, uh, to, to bring this sample in a little bit, uh, taking academia a little bit further, um, when we when we uh, and and stepping back a little bit, uh, I like to think about in us being in the fourth industrial revolution today. But each industrial revolution so far ha has brought in new technologies and innovation. Starting with the first industrial revolution, with the 
uh, with the um, uh, with the steam engine, the second industrial revolution with electrification and mass production, with third industrial revolution bringing uh, digitization with computers and with the internet, and of course, uh, changing the world, making it more global, uh, making e-commerce and businesses like Amazon possible. And today, when we are in the fourth revolution, we are talking about uh, AI and big data and the internet of things and cloud as it has come up in our, in our conversations. Most importantly, this uh, merging, this convergence of the digital and the physical worlds. And from here, I want to take it into academia where it would not, you know, with the third industrial revolution, it has been possible for academia to launch, um, uh, to launch online teaching, but it took the pandemic to get us to the point of where we are able to add value to all of our students uh, with with uh, you know functions with software such as such as workday which we use for internal purposes but with tools such as zoom that we can reach out to uh, to everybody uh, and and bringing in uh, equity to some extent in terms of making education accessible to all students because of these tools, uh, the fourth industrial revolution tools that are uh, available today. Uh, one more, uh, this is a sector that uh, I really enjoy learning about um, because I'm a consumer uh, rather than a worker and that's the automotive sector. Uh, it's, um, I think about it as IoT in terms of uh, the card uh, used to be just a hardware, but today it's become software. That's what Tesla has done to us. Uh, it's brought the convergence of the hardware and software. And because of that, um, data is collected um, uh, by this hardware device. AI algorithms work on it and make it more effective to be able to uh, to be able to solve problems. I find that there's another software update, and that problem that I was facing has been solved. Um, I see that happening for uh, for uh, robots, but, you know, autonomous uh, by autonomous systems such as robots uh, in helping in warehouses. I also see companies such as Neuro that are now using autonomous vehicles to do delivery. You know, all of this is helping bring the IoT, the, the convergence of the physical and the digital worlds in the fourth industrial revolution, making it happen. Now that is also bringing about challenges. I saw Larry posted uh, ethics uh, as one of the challenges. Chantal mentioned one of the biases and ethics being the challenge of these fourth industrial revolution technologies. Uh, big data is bringing about privacy issues, cybersecurity with hacks on a daily basis is becoming another problem. So while uh, these fourth industrial revolution technologies are resulting in digital transformation, they're also bringing about these issues and these problems that we need to keep in perspective as we continue to use them. Thank you, Anna. Those are great insights. I'm going to take it back to Jennifer. Um, and Jennifer, since you lead process technologies at Workday, can you explain how processes are becoming more connected through fourth industrial revolution technologies, uh, such as automa automation, information of things, and um, machine learning? Sure. Um, I would say that the fourth industry revolution technologies are driving two key connectivity trends within processes. Um, before I start about what those two key trends are, I will share with maybe a foundation of like what, how many processes are we talking about? What are the common volume in an enterprise customer? So typically, and maybe Jenna, you can keep me on this since you also have insights into that area too. Um, typically, a medium to large size enterprise owns up to like 1200 software systems. As Vandana mentioned, like when her first year in the beginning of last year, that's many systems just even in her role that she needs to manage. Imagine those in the HR department, IT department, et cetera. And just alone, if you look into Zoom into Workday, we are seeing on average about 2 million transactions per customer per year. So you multiply that amount to the number of software that they may have, that's a lot of process that a single company is managing. So the two key connectivity trends, um, I would say, that, uh, that 4R has brought to the processes 
One is driving processes to be more touchless. So automation and machine learning have enlightened enterprises to find creative ways to reduce the manual intervention during processes. Um, a lot of you probably heard about robotic process automation, RPA, that allows users to design, deploy, manage software robots that emulates human action interactions within softwares. Its market is growing really rapidly. And I, from what I read in reports, like Kager is 32% in the next six years going to a 13 billion market. Another example is um, process mining and task mining. These software uses past events, trends, and patterns to visualize commonly occurring business processes and variants, then let users to identify, diagnose, and remediate these inefficiencies and improve their KPIs. Now, all of these are making these general processes and enterprises more touchless. But what, what resonated a lot with me when Chantel was sharing about ethical AI in Workday, we also, we also pride ourselves of being responsible ML. These automation, these robots have displaced a lot of workers or potentially displacing workers out of their jobs. But, and that's not the intention of where we see enterprise software to be. At Workday, we use machine learning to supercharge users, not to replace them. And we apply machine learning in ways that augment the users, increase the value of their judgment and productivity by supporting better, faster decision-making. For example, we use machine learning to service insights so you're more informed um, making decisions. We free up time, like there's definitely some manual repetitive work that you can streamline and we also support that as well. But we also remove um, barriers to action, like we personalize the user interaction, like how I said I can approve PTO through Slack so that you can actually do your things much faster and complete tasks in a more efficient way. Um, so I could see that this is the second trend here. I would summarize is how far I can drive processes to be more seamless and that still be, uh, make Workday becoming, continues to be a responsible partner. We're not displacing workers, we're empowering workers. Thank you, Jennifer, that was wonderful. So I wanted to thank all the panelists for their answers. We're gonna do one closing question now and it's open to everybody um, to jump in on this. Um, so my question is, how can we prepare our next generation of women leaders to be relevant for the future of work? I can start. Um, I was sharing with Dean Smith earlier, I was really touched by her opening speech and I'll piggyback on two strengths um, that she mentioned agility and connection. Again, like I'm not going down the technical part, I'm going to share more of my career progression and all for, for, um, for the audience here. On agility, um, do follow your passion. Um, I was sharing in the breakout group how I started in aviation industry and I, it was only when I saw how hard it was as a customer to migrate from my legacy system to cloud-based that I dropped everything came to UCLA from Hong Kong and took my degree and went into uh, product management. It requires a lot of courage, but we can be very agile and it's our strength. And so utilize that. And once you're in there, once you get into this place, I'm sure a lot of you are since you, oh, many of you are alumni, um, do one thing that I regret not doing sooner, find a sponsor. We have our strength in connection. Um, it's working hard, on your own does not really help you get to the next ring in the ladder. So find your sponsor, build your connection around um, people around you. What I like to do um, is to kind of mark people who I see think that I want to be in 10 years time and try to find them as my sponsor so I can learn from them and learn the experiences. So I would strongly encourage you to leverage those two strengths that we have, agility and connection. Very good, thanks. Uh, yeah, maybe I would add to that. I uh, totally agree with Jennifer. Follow your passion. That's this, uh, that's the key criteria for su eventual success, as I believe. But also, I would add to that. Um, uh, just um, 
advocate for yourself, right? And uh, create, uh, expand your role responsibilities frequently when we find a job, but just uh, kind of limited by our role and just follow what we're kind of supposed to do. But if you want to grow, find the responsibility, what else you could do, how you could expand your role, how else you could contribute and create the leadership role for yourself, right? Maybe if you don't have it today, find the opportunity to create it. And when you got there, then advocate for yourself and eventually you get where you want to get. Okay, I'm going to say something that's a little unorthodox and it is number one and the first, first and foremost thing that I would actually do is I'd take the time to work on yourself. I'd take the time to forgive. I would take the time to grow and understand your insecurities. I would take the time to actually work on all of the fears and strip off the labels that you put on yourself. And I say this to everyone because that's what I did at the beginning of COVID-19. I just wanna share just for 10 or 20 seconds, I had an amazing job opportunity to work for the Commonwealth Games in the UK connected to Oxford University. And this was working on a global massive truth and reconciliation charter for the colonial injustices in the past and successfully implemented that which is what birthed my company, Cornerstone AI. But once COVID hit, I realized I either had to pivot and shift and switch. But instead of jumping onto the next project or trying to be ambitious, trying to do something else, I took the time to stop, to be unemployed for a year and a half and to focus on the internal insecurities that I had. And in order for you to be successful later down the road and to be authentic to who you were created to be, you need to know your purpose and your why. And I think taking the time to do that first will set you streets and, and put you on a trajectory and a path that it will just be authentic and you can have your own voice in these arenas as well. And I, sorry, I, I'll add some from my own personal experiences. Uh, one, find role models uh, that uh, you align with. Uh, and uh, role models and me mentors. Uh, second is women helping women. Uh, big one on that, um, on the executive board of uh, Women's uh, Initiative Network, WIN, uh, where the motto is women helping women. As more uh, women become leaders, if they're able to help more women and men, uh, uh, it'll, it'll help bring more of the equity uh, that we are all, um, uh, striving for. Uh, and third and fourth are uh, take pick up careers, make choices that will keep you relevant for the future. Follow what's happening in the digital world today and pick career paths that will keep you aligned, that will keep you relevant. And final is lifelong learning, a big proponent of that. Just because school ends does not mean that learning needs to end. We all have to continue to learn throughout our lives. So lifelong learning. Thank you, everyone. I think we just have two questions. If we can, um, if I can ask those to the panel. Okay. Uh, the first one, I think it's specifically for Chantal. But um, how do you do? How do your algorithms define bias in data? And that is from um, Mr. Mostaf. Perfect. Yes, I just sent him a direct message about that. But in general, the way that we detect bias is we look at the sensitive variable and you look at the causal effects that it has on the outcome variables that's there. That's how our algorithms are able to compute and to code, but also look at near neighboring techniques and more statistical. So this goes into the more computer science and statistical analysis, but you look at the cause and effect inferences between the sensitive variable and the outcome variables in any ML technology system that's there. Thank you, Chantal. Um, the Second question um, for Anna, I believe. Do you want to answer this one? Um, so I'm actually posing it to okay. ask all of the panelists since we have uh, Chantal from um, a startup and uh, Jeanette and Jennifer from industry in terms of this is a question since we have academia and industry here together, Nora and I just wanted to ask what their thoughts are on partnerships between academia and industry to prepare students for 
you know, today's digital world, this fourth industrial revolution world that we're in. Feel free to just unmute. Um, that's, that's a great question. I'm happy to share my thoughts on that. I come in more on an R&D perspective, research and development, but I'm also shifting and focusing into the federal government and government contracts. But then there's also consumers, the private sector that's also there. I get pushback within my own team internally, but it's because of academia. I know the power that is there behind partnerships. And I think when we're looking at the perspective of even ethical AI, a major flaw is that the different stakeholders within these different entities are not talking to each other. You've got philosophers, people that are working on ethics, people that are computer engineers, technicians that's there in the lab, people who can produce more books and continuously speak about these topics, but they're not creating those partnerships and digitally connecting or even taking the time to learn a subject matter about AI and law, learn something that's outside of their comfort zone. And I think the power behind partnerships is really taking the time to expand your knowledge and to go into those different sectors that's there so you can play in all those different fields. Uh, maybe I could add to that from uh, my perspective that's actually uh, talking about our experience at UCLA Anderson. In Anderson, we used to have this uh, six month program at the end of the two year MBA. Um, I believe it was called Applied Research Management product, uh, Project, uh, where we would partner from the school perspective, right? The school would partner with their top employers to work on specific business uh, problems, business issues with uh, teams of students. And uh, I did that as part of UCLA and here at Capgemini, we partnered with UCLA to work together with a team of MBA students on specific business problems we had at hand at that time. That was around uh, Internet of Things and IoT use cases a few years ago. So that's another opportunity, I believe, to kind of um, we're partnered together to work on uh, specific business issues, doing specific research and solving any any customer issues we have to we have to address and uh, explore at, from the business perspective. I echo that, and I'll add on. Also, I think um, reviewing or re looking into what my experience at, at UCLA in my early years of work day, what I wish we had done more, and then this is also us as a student to do more, is to expose ourselves more to different um, opportunities to upskill our communication influencing stakeholder management skills. I think when it comes to where there are so many opportunities out there and everyone is trying to um, build business cases, build wrap up for specific ideas and all those, you have a lot of competing um, people trying to compete for the same resource. By improving those soft skill sets, not only like helps you um, uh, make sure you can articulate very well what you're trying to do, but also win people over for the same resources. So I think it's one thing that um, we could bridge more uh, to help student transition from um, academia environment to more professional environment. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to all the panelists for your wonderful insights today. Um, if we can do a round of applause from everybody, that would be great. Thank you.